how much of a given day, let's assume I sit down three times a day for five minutes, relax, don't look at my phone, don't drink coffee, don't cross my legs, I'm perfectly zen, I put the cuff on my arm, I measure the blood pressure, it's 120 over 80. Let's assume I do that three times a day and I get that number. How reflective is that of what my blood pressure is when I'm sleeping? Let's say I'm sleeping eight hours. When I'm exercising, let's say I'm exercising for an hour, 90 minutes a day. And when I'm sitting at my desk, stressing out over email, how, how, how much variation am I getting? Tons. So, you know, it, the first time I ever got, was in the cath lab, it was really amazing to me to see the variation in blood pressure just in a patient lying on a table based on before they were sedated and after they were sedated. Or I mean, like, you know, there are all yeah, kinds yeah, of yeah. things. So there's no doubt that there's a huge amount of variation from second to second, minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day and beyond in blood pressure. And I think it's very easy to get distracted by that. And, and I do all the time. And obviously when I'm sitting in traffic, my blood pressure is not 120 over 80. When my kid, you know, spills coffee all over the computer, it's not 120 over 80, right? That when I'm exercising, it's not 120 over. There's physiology and there's pathophysiology. So mm -hmm. physiologically, our blood pressure does go up and it's meant to go up during some of these cases. It's, it's a function of increased cardiac output, which is one of the components of, of blood pressure. So uh, I think it's understandable. The question then is what do you do about that relative and sort of how best you measure blood pressure? And so again, and this is a broken record, I'll just keep doing this, but I fall back on the clinical trials and just as you know, we try to practice as best we can with some sort of fidelity to the way the trials are done, I go back to sort of how are they measuring blood pressure in these trials and therefore how are the decisions made to adjust medications and how did that influence the, yeah. the practice of the trial and therefore how should that influence our practice? Because those are the outcomes that we look at. So this got a lot of attention when Sprint was first published, which was I think 2014 or 15, I can't remember the exact date, but it got a huge amount of attention there was all kinds of pushback from almost every angle you could think of. There were a lot of people out there who felt like this is just yet another example of medicine trying to do too much. The less is more crowd hated it, right? That this is just over medicalizing normal aging, right? Da -da 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 -da. There was a significant at amount of attention paid on how they actually measured the blood pressure because it wasn't the way that we typically measure blood pressure. And it was the way that we probably ought to measure blood pressure but it certainly wasn't the way that we typically measure blood pressure. So if you go back and you look at the data, if you look at the methods, what they did was they had people in a quiet room, they had an automated cuff, one of the sort of standard, you know, sort of uh, best in class at that time, automated cuff. They put the cuff on the person, they had them sit, seated and relaxed in a quiet room by themselves. And they had the blood pressure measured three times, five minutes in between, right? So a total of you know, once, five minute break, one more, five minute break and, and once more. And they took the average of those blood pressures. And that's obviously much different than having somebody rush in after parking their car and run into the office in a sweat and show up and somebody slaps a cuff on them and measures the blood pressure. But my point is that that optimal way of blood, measuring blood pressure, even if it ends up yielding numbers that are lower than are what we typically get, that led to the result in that trial, which was so spectacular that the trial was stopped early. And this is not, to all the you know, conspiracy theorists out there, this was not a pharma-sponsored sponsored trial. This is an NIH-sponsored trial, the government-sponsored trial, and was agnostic to different agents, right? I mean, it was not about the, the physicians who enrolled patients in the trial had, had access to almost any therapy during that trial. So this was not about sort of proving the, the benefit of one drug over another. This is purely about testing the hypothesis that getting as close to 120 over 80, rather than letting people sort of float up to 140 over 90 was better or not. And it turned out that it was, with caveats. So let's, let's talk about that methodology and then let's talk about the algorithm agents and then the, the potential downsides. So um, I have started testing my blood pressure six months ago. Uh, and the reason for it, so I've, I shouldn't say that I have always checked my blood pressure because both my parents have hypertension. I'd always attributed to the fact that I had low blood pressure to the fact that I was super healthy and did all these other things. But I realized, look, there's genetics to this as well. 
So I'm just going to start checking my blood pressure every couple of days. And I did. And so for a couple of years, I just checked my blood pressure three, four times a week, just when I'm sitting at the desk working, never attempting to relax or rest or do anything. And it was pretty low, you know, probably averaged 110 over 70 was sort of a typical reading of while I was sitting there working. Um, and then something happened in August. It was consistently a little bit higher than that. Not a lot higher, but it was 125 to 130. And it was, you know, more or less 80 in the denominator. This made me get a little more serious. I got another cuff. And now I started doing the full sit protocol three times a day with both the Omron cuff and the Withings cuff. Mm -hmm. And what I realized were two things. The first is I can always breathe my blood pressure down to normal. In other words, there's never been a five minute window when if I don't sit there and really focus on breathing, I can't get that blood pressure to come to normal. But most often than not, that first reading, the second I sit down, especially in August, it got better in October and September was kind of a transition month. It's kind of normalized now, but it was not uncommon for that first one to be as high as 140 over 90. If I just, you know, was literally doing something, not exercising, but if I was, you know, doing something active and then I went and sat down, like the equivalent of the guy who shows up from the parking garage, you know, yep. just parked the car, had to walk up one flight of stairs, sits down 140 over 90. Five minutes later, it's, you know, it's 117 over 74. And, you know, I've been in sort of a back and forth discussion with my doctor and with my colleagues about is this something I need to care about? Because now if you look at my spreadsheet and all of my phone data, my blood pressure looks perfectly normal. For the last six months, I've averaged below 120 over 80. But I kind of feel like I'm cheating, Ethan, because to guarantee that it's low, I have to take five minutes of being calm, which then makes well, me wonder. I know that that's in line with how the sprint study was done. And you could argue, well, Peter, you're simply, you're actually doing something that's less extreme than what they did because they did three measurements over 10 minutes. But I think, but deep down, I know my blood pressure is not 120 over 80 when I'm sitting at my computer, you know, writing because when I check that blood pressure straight away, it's, it's, it's above that. So I hear your point that it's okay. I mean, what I think I'm hearing you say is based on the way the trial was done, we have to assume that the other people when they first sat down might've been higher as well. Yeah. So here's what I would say is I think, uh, sounds like something changed in you. And yeah, a I book think, deadline is definitely what changed yeah. in August. So, so there's that, no question that well, was Well, so that if was that's the case, then that's understandable and that's, that's okay. I think uh, in your case, it sounds like what I was going to say was if it, it was truly a change and there was no explanation for it, like a lot of things in medicine, uh, then I probably uh, would have paid more attention to it, even though it was going from what was normal to normal, right? That you just... It sounded like something did change, but in this case, it sounds like there is an explanation and that you had this stress in your life from the book. Uh, so I guess the cheating thing reminds me of my daughter, who I think I told you before, is uh, my younger daughter is legally blind and she plays basketball and we were discussing a potential, uh, this is such a crazy little aside, but I thought I'd tell the story because it's kind of cute. She, we were discussing a potential procedure she could have to improve her vision because uh, part of her decrement of visual acuity is that she has pretty bad nystagmus, uh, lateral nystagmus. And the ophthalmologist was saying that if you can sort of make that better, you'll improve, understandably, you'll improve her visual acuity. And that they, somebody stumbled onto the idea that if you cut the optic, the extraocular muscles and just reattach them, don't do anything else, but just sever them and reattach them, that nystagmus can go away and that people's visual acuity can improve a lot. So we thought, well, gosh, that sounds really interesting. We should do that. Uh, it's fascinating how that might happen. But uh, she said she didn't want to do it because she was like, that's cheating. This is a kid who runs around with a you know, visual acuity of 20 over 200. And mm. uh, she was like, that's cheating. So we haven't been able to convince her to do it yet. We'll see if she changes her mind someday. But I don't think you're cheating. Uh, what you're doing is optimizing the measurement. I think. What you could do if you want to, and maybe you've already done it, if you really want to get a sense, and it would be great to have this over time serially, is to do a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor 
to really get a sense of what, what is the average blood pressure you're seeing over a 24 hour period. Cause there is a difference when you're sleeping, your blood pressure should be low, right? That's physiology. Yep. When you're out and about and doing things, it's going to be higher. So what is the, you know, sort of average, and they can quantify all the spikes and it's actually a really nice tool that I'll use in people, especially in people who have some degree of what's, you know, commonly termed white coat hypertension, which is kind of what, I mean, white coat hypertension is real life, right? White coat hypertension is living in the real world. Uh, so, so how do, how does a how does an ambulatory uh, BP cuff work? Um, it's it's presumably a cuff that sits on the arm and then it straps to a device like a halter would. I, I actually, it's funny. I don't think I've ever seen a device. Uh, I've ordered a bunch. Uh, I, it's a cuff, so it's really old school, right? It's not like this is new technology where they can measure blood pressure without doing the old sphingomanometer. So it's a cuff. It's, I think, got a self, I would imagine it's got some, you know, hardware attached to it that tells it to inflate and measure blood pressure just as you would a, with a one that you have in your office. And it does that once a, a minute or whatever it is over the course of 24 hours. So it's constantly inflating, deflating over the course of a, of a day. Patients who have mine who've worn them say that after a while you get used to it and just you can ignore it. It seems to me like it would be really annoying to have this thing like inflating and deflating all the time, but that's what it is. What it does though is it buys it buys you sort of a, a, a distraction from real life. It buys you sort of when you're not thinking about things, when you're clearly not stressed or you shouldn't be stressed, i.e. when you're sleeping, um, what is your blood pressure? And we know that blood pressure, that hypertension during sleep is abnormal. It's the, It should really be a time when your blood pressure is the lowest. So. It's just a t another tool that we have to kind of get at that question. It is always interesting to me that we measure blood pressure not just once a you know 10 or 30 second interval in a 24 hour day, but that we do that you know on average you know once or twice a year and that, that we <laughs> assume that this very variable number is actually meaningful. And it's a remarkable to me that it has been even meaningful the way that we've been measuring it. Um, because it is such a poor sample. I mean, we 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 in our patients will will ask them to do twice a day checks at home, same method that I'm using for at least two weeks once a year. And you know, if we have reason to believe that that suspect will do it more, and yet, so even though that's much more than they would be asked to do normally, it still feels woefully inadequate. And I've tried a bunch of devices that's supposed to measure you know, supposedly measuring blood pressure, like little wrist-based devices. Yeah. I've never found them to work. Is there anything on the horizon that's that's uh, that's closing you, the gap on that? You'd think so. Uh, you know, there was a period of time where people were using a cell phone camera and you could press your finger on the camera and that it could basically detect the pulsation. It could almost calculate a, uh, you know, a pulse wave and mm. it could give you a sort of imputed systolic and diastolic blood pressure that never made it. Obviously, we don't, we're not seeing those around. We're not seeing any other devices that people can wear that can accurately measure blood pressure. So I do think it's a interesting question. I, you'd have to think that at some point, even if it's an intravascular device, that you could put a miniature device, you know, much like, you know, we're now using, uh, I don't know how much you use them, but I use them a lot, these uh, uh, implantable event monitors, these loop recorders, we use them to detect arrhythmias. It sounds bad, right, when you think about it, but it's really not that big of a deal. There has to be a way to get a pressure transducer into a into an artery safely that you could leave there for some period of time. It feels like that's gonna come, but I haven't seen it. And then non-invasively would be amazing, but I just, again, haven't seen it, so. Yeah, it's it, you know I, I as you know I find CGM to be kind of a remarkable tool. I would think this is even more important because glucose, in many ways, is less variable than blood pressure, or at least its variability is more predictable. Um, in other words, you could I think much more easily get by with just spot checks of glucose than you can with just spot checks of, of blood pressure. To have a true continuous uh, ambulatory BP monitor, I mean that that would really be a game changer in medicine. Again, when you think about the heart, when you think about the brain, when you think about the kidneys, it's such an important thing. I, do, I agree with you. I think that said, the intervention that was used in Sprint still showed a remarkable benefit. And so we can't exist with the tools we have. Yeah, yeah. And while they're not optimal, 
they're uh, they're probably adequate. And they're definitely better. You know, if you go back and look, and this is part of this lecture I used to give, if you look at sort of the percentage of people that have um, either diagnosed blood pressure, right? So uh, how many people are, are known to have hypertension um, who actually do have it? How many people are treated at all, right? Even have on any medicine? And how many people are controlled? If you look back in, in time, when this was first done in the first NHANE survey in the, in the whatever, 1975, 76, whatever that was, only 50% of people who had hypertension were even aware of it. Only 30% were actually ever treated and only 10% were controlled. And hmm. I don't know what the most current numbers are, but the n awareness has gone up. It must be north of 80% now. Treatment is probably 75 or 80% and control is probably somewhere around 50%. So we're still missing 50, the opportunity to treat 50% of people with this disease.